into the chicken, I don't end up with spicy hands because I don't need that. I'll rub my arm, my eyes, I'm sure. So we're gonna use half a cup of this seasoning. Now you could put all the chicken pieces in a bowl and toss everything together. But what I'm gonna do is instead of dirtying yet another bowl, because I have to do the dishes after, I mean, that's the part that I think most people don't enjoy when they're cooking is the dishes, but my dishwasher will be ready to go. And then what you're gonna do is just rub the jerk seasoning all over the chicken, okay? Emily, there's so a quick it, question here. Um, yeah. Sorry to interrupt you, just about the seasoning. So what kind yeah. of, is that, is that grace? It is, it is grace seasoning. So in um, the international aisles of most grocery stores, there's a great um, section of grace products. And they have, I love a lot of their products. I love their hot sauces. Um, used sparingly, um, but their jerk seasoning is what I'm using tonight. Um, and you can find them pretty much in small and large grocery stores. I know if you're smalling at a shopping at a smaller grocery store like No Frills or Food Basics, they have great international sections and you'll definitely find it there. There. So I'm going to, I already have my oven at 400 degrees. Okay, and it's gonna go right into the oven. So I've already used two ingredients. That means I have three more left. I always like doing a countdown. I've noticed when I'm, I do these recipes on television, the hosts get a kick out of counting the ingredients just to make sure that I'm not tricking them in any way. All right, so we're gonna cook the chicken a little bit first. And what we're gonna do is get our vegetables ready so that when the chicken, we're gonna put the chicken in for 15 minutes. We're also gonna add some sweet potatoes and that helps balance off that little bit of heat from the jerk seasoning. So this is just your regular little sweet potato, just a couple and I've scrubbed them and I'm gonna cut them into fries. Now I have left the skin on. You do not have to, if you don't want to, you can peel them. Okay, so that's totally optional. And if you didn't have sweet potatoes, you could just use regular potatoes but I love the color contrast and the flavor contrast. So about one inch pieces into my bowl. And I'm also gonna add an onion just to give us a nice little bit of flavor and it will crisp up really nicely. This would be a great place to use a red onion if you had it. And then to mimic some of the flavor in the jerk seasoning, I'm actually using some fresh thyme, okay? Now, if you didn't have fresh thyme, you could also use dried thyme. Um, and the recipe calls for two teaspoons of fresh thyme chopped, but if all you had was dried, I would use about a teaspoon, okay? Typically when you're using um, dried versus fresh, fresh you're always doing three to one. Now I love dried thyme, so using half is perfectly okay. And then we're gonna add a little bit of salt and pepper. Those are my free ingredients. So if you're counting, I've definitely used my five. And then some canola oil just to help everything come together and create that nice crispness when we add it to the sheet pan. All right, so this is tossed and ready to go. I'm gonna set it on my back counter so that I can add it right to the sheet pan after those 15 minutes. After the 15 minutes that the chicken has been in there, it will take about another 20 minutes for the sweet potatoes to cook through and for the chicken to finish cooking. Okay, so I thought what would be really cool is if I could do all this stuff in real time. Now I did prep ahead. So obviously I have a lot of things chopped and measured and ready to go. But I thought this would be inspirational if I could get five things done, five ingredient recipes in an hour. And if I don't, well, then I, at least I tried, right? Well, well right. the good news is we're timing you, Emily. Um, oh, great. I, I do I do have a question, why canola oil? I always struggle with um, oils and the oils that you should heat versus the oils that become toxic. So why canola oil? That's a great question. And it's actually a question that comes up, up quite often. Canola oil, first of all, Canadian oil, always support our local Canadian farmers as best you can. And um, it's a neutral oil and it's great to cook at high heat um, because it has a high smoke point. Not that we're gonna be, smoking anything here, but at 400 degrees, you want something that is gonna be okay in the heat. Now, 
Um, if you wanted to, you could use olive oil in place of the canola oil. It would work equally well. We're not using that much, so the flavor transfer isn't huge. Um, but because I want the spice flavor of the jerk seasoning to come through, I definitely want to use a neutral oil so that that will benefit from it. And I have canola oil because I bake with it as well because it doesn't have any flavor. So it's a great oil to use for that. Um, although that said, there's a great olive oil cake in the five ingredient cookbook too that has a great olive flavor. So it's, it's beneficial to have both. So we have dinner in the oven, let's make breakfast. <laughs> for those of you that aren't doing anything tomorrow morning around 8.20, um, I'm gonna be on CH Morning Live making pancakes and a few other things from the cookbook, but I thought this will give me good practice tonight for tomorrow morning. So these are a blender banana oatmeal pancake. So Michelle sent out an email this afternoon and if you happen to have those ingredients on hand, this is how easy it is to put together. You just need your blender and I'm gonna add my bananas. And these are very large bananas that are nice and ripe. Um, if you have bananas that are really ripe that you've kind of tucked away in the freezer, you could definitely use those here too. In the end, you need about one cup of mashed bananas. So smaller bananas, you might need about three, but in our case, these are so big, they're not even staying together. Um, I'm gonna use two because they're quite large. And they're nice and ripe, they have lots of brown spots. The riper and darker the bananas are, the sweeter they are. So that natural sweetness will be much more apparent if the bananas are darker. A couple of eggs, these are large eggs. In all the recipes, particularly in North America, it's always large eggs that are used. Emily, uh, we have a question here. This is from Michelle yes. Ivy. Can you substitute the oats for uh, quinoa flakes? Oh, that's a great suggestion. And I think it would definitely work. Um, I would use the same amount. And because you need to let this mixture sit for a bit, the quinoa flakes would work to absorb some of the liquid as well. And what I want people to notice is that we're not adding any additional flavors here. It's the banana, the eggs. I'm using almond milk. This is unsweetened because I have the ripe sweetness of the banana. They don't need to add any more sugar to it. So where you would add the quinoa flakes in place of the oats is right here. This is two cups of regular old fashioned or large flake oats. If you only have quick oats, that will work too. Um, this just gives it a little bit more texture because they're larger. Now the quinoa flakes, if you're using those, you'll get a finer batter, which will be okay too, because it'll be much more, it'll replicate a little bit more as a normal pancake. By normal, I mean a wheat pancake. So did I get everything in there? That's five, isn't it? No, I forgot two more things. Baking powder, because we do want this to puff up a little bit like a pancake and a little bit of salt. If you're wondering why salt is in there, it just helps bring out the flavor of other things. I know oftentimes you'll hear people say, well, I'm not gonna add the salt because I don't use salt. That's one reason, especially if it's for health reasons. I'm just gonna pop this in my blender here so it'll make some noise. There we go. I will probably have to stir it a little bit too. But salt helps bring out all the other flavors. So we'll get that nice banana flavor to come through as well as the almond milk flavor. Now there is vanilla almond milk, which that's what I'm using tonight. If you just have regular almond milk, you could always add a drop of vanilla in there. So I'm gonna just give this a little stir because my blender needs some help. If you have a heavy duty blender, you definitely don't have to do this. It'll whiz Emily, up in no time. Yes. I think a few people are cooking long, which is great. Um, oh, that's so awesome. Can you just review the recipe, like how much uh, salt, how much uh, baking soda, just review the recipe so everyone that's cooking along uh, knows. I will flip to my page 10 in the cookbook because that's where it is. And I will give you the exact amount. So it's one cup of mashed bananas or two to three bananas, two large eggs, one cup of vanilla almond milk, two cups of large flake oats, two teaspoons of baking powder, and a quarter teaspoon of salt. 
And then I'm just making sure that my batter is buzzed up enough here. Now, when you look at your batter, and think about when you're whisking pancake batter together, it's a little bit liquidy. And in particular, when you're using oats or different non-wheat ingredients, it needs a little time just to settle and thicken up a bit, okay? So I'm just gonna let it set, sit here for about five minutes. We'll try not to, I won't forget about it because it's right here, but sometimes I start talking about other things and then I forget what I'm doing. I'm just gonna move these down here. So now we can breathe, have a drink. If you're having a drink, I'm gonna have some water because my throat's dry. Okay, and we're just gonna let this sit here for a minute. In the meantime, we're gonna start something else. We're gonna let something else sit. We're gonna make crackers because why wouldn't you make crackers with five ingredients? And you may have all this lovely stuff in your freezer. And I say freezer because that's where you should store it. So we're gonna start off. These are homemade seed crackers. Fabulous to have on hand for any type of snack, appetizer. And we're gonna have it with cheese tonight. We're gonna make pimento cheese as well. So I have a combination- Sorry, I should let everyone know that we will send you the recipe afterwards so that you have yes. it. Yes, definitely. Um, so I have a variety of different seeds here. I'm going to start off with pumpkin seeds going into my bowl. And now these are pumpkin seeds that are just plain. They haven't been um, salted or anything like that. And they are going to provide a really nice texture and color for our crackers. And this is half a cup of each of these seeds that I'm adding. I'm also going to add half a cup of sesame seeds. Okay. And you can buy all this stuff in bulk. You don't have to buy it in the bags. Oftentimes when it's bought, purchased in small bags, it ends up costing a little bit more. So feel free to go to a health food store or the bulk store and buy it in bulk. Chia seeds, half a cup. These are black chia seeds. You could use white chia seeds and half a cup of ground flax. And this is golden ground flax. Uh, but you can use regular flax seed. And if you don't have it ground, you can just grind your own flax seeds in a coffee grinder or spice grinder, and that will work beautifully. So those are all the seeds that I'm using. We want to add a little bit of flavor to it. So I'm just going to use two teaspoons of Italian seasoning. Italian seasoning I use often because it's a nice mixture of different herbs and it adds lots of flavor. Okay. If you don't have Italian seasoning, you could use a mixture of oregano, basil, you could add some garlic powder in here if you wanted to and change it up a little bit. And then of course, a touch of salt is gonna go in here too. Okay, just about a quarter teaspoon. If you find after you make these, you want a little bit more saltiness to it, you can actually sprinkle some salt on top and I'll show you what I'm talking about when we get there. So there's our six ingredients, including salt. A, a question about the seeds, Emily, and I've yes. wondered uh, too, because I've heard mixed uh, reviews. So Pamela was asking, should we be storing our seeds in the freezer all the time? I've heard, I've heard that because I've heard that seeds can become toxic. Yes, I would recommend that you keep them in the freezer all the time, um, unless you're using them every day and you're going to go through them quickly. Um, so they're best kept in the freezer because they have their natural oils that as they sit, they start to produce that oil on the outside. And that's what becomes rancid, which in turn then turns all the seeds rancid. So we definitely want to avoid that. And by keeping them in the freezer, you don't have to worry about it. Now, if you're thinking, well, I'm using it from frozen, the seeds aren't going to take all that time to thaw. So don't feel that, you know, if you're adding them to muffins, for example, or smoothie, or even in these crackers, by the time you measure everything out, mix it up, they've already kind of thawed to the point that you can add the water, which is all we're gonna do. We're adding a cup and a quarter of water, okay? Now, for those of you that have had chia seeds and flax before, you know about the soluble power that they have when it comes to fiber. So if you've had chia pudding, you stir it up, it looks very liquidy, and then overnight, it thickens up like a pudding. So that's essentially what we're doing in this mixture. We're just gonna let this sit and it will start to thicken up before we pour it onto our baking sheet to make the crackers. So when you think about it, 
crackers are super easy to make and we have no weed in here, which is great. So if you have a gluten-free family member or if you're having friends and you're not quite sure if they're, you know, what diet they're on, <laughs> um, it's always great to have some crackers that they can eat. So I'm just gonna set this aside because we need that to thicken up a bit. And we're gonna go back to the pancakes and get some in the skillet. And these are all great questions, by the way. So if you have other questions, please feel free. It's always great to feel like I can answer them. I always tell people if I can't, I will definitely get the answer to you. Um, I promise I won't make one up. I will try to give you the right answer. So I'm just using a skillet for my pancakes. Um, you can use a griddle. I'm just using some cooking spray. You could use, if you wanted to, just some an oil um, and brush and put some on your skillet there. If you wanted a deeper flavor for your pancakes, you could definitely use a little bit of melted butter in here. That's not part of our ingredient list, so that would be a sixth ingredient, uh, but it definitely would kind of give you a slightly different flavor. So as it sits, now the idea is you just take this and start pouring it, but I wanted to show you that it does thicken up really, really nicely. So I'm gonna put it in this camera, Michelle, and just so you can kind of see it has that thicker pancake batter to it. So if you wanted to, you could very easily just use a ladle if you didn't want to pour it out. So I'm gonna use a ladle only because these have to be on TV tomorrow, so they have to look beautiful. All right, and I my heat isn't too high. Pancakes are fast, so we, they don't need a lot of time to cook in a skillet, usually two to three minutes on one side and then flip them over when those bubbles appear and in a minute, the other side is done. I'm gonna get another pancake in here. And then that's my chicken, that's been 15 minutes. So we're gonna take that out, turn off the timer for a minute, get a blast of hot air here. And I'm just gonna bring this over to my other camera here so I can show you that what's happened is the jerk seasoning has kind of set up. You can see that the chicken is firming up as well. So now in all these spaces that I have, I'm going to add my sweet potatoes in here, okay? Just like that. And then it's gonna go back into the oven, just like so. Now, if you really disliked onions, you could leave them out and use a different vegetable here. Peppers would be really nice. Some red peppers would add some great color. Or the green, the green pepper, which no one seems to love, but it would be a great thing to add in here too. And then this goes back into the oven for at least 20 minutes. Now, if you're using convection, it will happen much quicker. So keep an eye on it, maybe check it in about 15 minutes. So we'll put that back in and I'll put the timer on so I don't forget about it. And then my pancakes, I'll show you what they look like in this camera. I have some bubbles on top, which is when you want to flip them so that you have that nice golden brown, okay, on the one side, and you can smell the bananas. Um, that's what's wonderful about this recipe is that you can actually have that lovely fragrance of the ripe bananas and the sweetness of them. All right, was that enough time? I bet you that was enough time. I want you to look in this other camera now and look at this. See how thick it got? The power of fiber. <laughs> so this is our seed mixture. This is what we're gonna make the crackers with. Um, you can use two baking sheets and spread it out. I'm actually just gonna put it on one and spread it out in the entire baking sheet. And I'm using parchment paper because that is your best friend when you're doing things like this. I'm just gonna grab a plate to take those pancakes out and I'll put a couple more in. They're nice and light. There they are. That one's a little wonky in shape, so I'm gonna have to, I'll just make a couple more here so that I have some on the plate. Now you can, this makes a lot of pancakes. Um, so you can make them all and then freeze them and then just pop them into the toaster if you like a firmer pancake. 
Or if you like a soft pancake, pop them in the microwave because that's where you're going to get a nice soft texture. So I'm going to spread out my seed mixture for my crackers. So I'm just using an offset spatula, which I love. I use it for many, many things, spreading mainly, but it's also good for flipping and serving. So what you wanna do is try to get a nice even layer. And if you want a really, really crisp cracker, you want this to be super thin. But if you want it a little bit thicker, then just leave it a bit thicker and it will need to bake a little bit longer. So I have my oven set at 350 because that's what we're going to bake this at. And if like you quick, quick question about yeah. the pancakes. Um, yeah. So uh, Tamisha was asking, how long can you keep it in the, the freezer for? Will it go soggy? Um, so what I do when I freeze pancakes is I freeze them on a baking sheet um, like this till they're solid. So in a single layer, and then I take them off once they're solid and stack them in an airtight container or a Ziploc bag. And I find that they don't get as soggy that way. Oftentimes people will layer them in between um, parchment paper, or wax paper in a stack and then freeze them. I find that they get a little bit smushy when that happens. So if you can have the patience to um, let them freeze solid and then stack them, the texture will be much better. And you can keep them in the freezer. I always tell people you can keep things for two weeks because most people will double that and easily leave it in for at least a month. So, um, and the reason why I say two weeks is because you want it to taste like you just made it. So if you leave it in longer, typically, it changes the texture a little bit, okay? I'm just gonna put a couple more on here so that I have at least a little bit of a stack to show you. Emily, with the crackers, you don't need any sort of spray or anything underneath or? Nope, you need nothing because what's gonna happen is the water is gonna evaporate and you're gonna end up with a crisp, big cracker. And <clears throat> I'll show you because don't worry, you don't have to wait for this one because this one's going to take way too long. Um, I did bake one so that I could show you what it looks like. Um, so you don't, using parchment paper. Now, if you didn't have parchment paper, I would spray your baking sheet with a little bit of cooking spray before I spread it out. But the parchment paper will definitely be your friend. So this basically fills the whole baking sheet at the thickness that I have. And I'm going to pop this into my other oven down below and we'll kind of forget about it. So this one takes at least 45 minutes to 50 minutes. So if you're only doing one baking sheet, you can leave it in the center of the oven and it's going to take about 45, 50 minutes. If you're doing it on two baking sheets, halfway through, you need to switch them so that one's on top is on the bottom and vice versa. And what you end up with is a big giant cracker, okay? And then all you need to do is break it up into the pieces that you want, okay? I don't know if you can hear that little bit of a, a snap. I'll bring it close to, can you hear that snap? Kind of, sort of. So you can make the crackers as big or as little as you want. And I'll put it in this camera and you can kind of see uh, definitely around the edge how it's a little jagged and the how thin it is. So I spread it out as similar to the one that I just did. Um, so it filled the whole pan and then it has a nice golden color. You'll definitely see the golden color happen because of the sesame seeds changing color. Um, and then you have the nice texture of the larger seeds like the pumpkin seeds, for example. And if you wanted to, you could add a few nuts to this um, that would give it a nice texture as well and add a slightly different flavor. So you can just break them up like that. And I'm going to set them aside because we're going to serve them with some cheese. And I'm going to flip these last pancakes. I'm going to try to make a nice little stack here to present to you of at least six pancakes. 
Emily, I agree with Pamela here that said those crackers look delicious. I'm still <laughs> going to make those as soon as we get off. <laughs> they look amazing. Well, and I mean, all you have to do is keep this stuff. The other thing I wanted to do tonight is I didn't want to make you have to, you know, run to the grocery store and buy a bunch of things. I'm hoping that some of these things you already have at home. Um, and if you have friends like I do, sometimes they'll give you things that then you can create. I have a big bag of chia seeds in my freezer, thanks to a good friend. And now I can make these crackers. I always have pumpkin seeds because they're great in muffins. Sesame seeds, use them in stir fry. And flax, I always have flax because I buy the big bag at Costco and then I share it with my sister and my mother and it's all good. Everybody gets some. <laughs> so it's always nice to share. There's our last two. There's my stack of six pancakes. I think those look will... beautiful. Kate, Kate says that um, she's making them right now as well. I guess oh, you're crackers. making the pancakes too? That's great. I think she... or, the, or the crackers. Is she making the crackers or the pancakes? I'm not sure. Kate, are you making crackers or pancakes? Oh crackers <laughs> oh perfect okay well then this is the perfect thing to serve with those crackers and that's pimento cheese this is i have been around for decades upon decades and it's called pimento cheese because of this lovely little jar of pimentos um, and pimentos are an actual red pepper so you can use roasted red peppers but pimentos have a little bit more of a briny taste to them. So if you think of like a pickle or olive taste, it, that's what pimento offers. So it's a nice balance between the richness of the cheese and the color from the pepper as well. So I'm going to try to open this jar. <laughs> you know, when you think you can open it, but you can't. There we go. Now I can. I popped it. There we are. All right. So my five ingredients for this pimento cheese is cream cheese, that's our base, some cheddar cheese, a stronger cheddar cheese, so an old cheddar would be good, mayonnaise, our pimentos, and some Worcester sauce. So if you think about it, this is kind of our salt. The, the Worcester tends to be a salty addition and I just want to make sure if anyone wants the amounts that I have them in front of me. So I'm just going to flip to that page. And if anyone has a copy of the book, <laughs> you can follow along on page 34 were the homemade seed crackers. And page 24, that's what I was looking for, for the pimento cheese. Oh, and we are going to add a little bit of salt and pepper, which I may have used for something else. So I'm going to have to... Uh, yeah, I'm going to bring my salt and pepper over. I used it for something else. Maybe I didn't need it. Oh, well, that's okay. I have lots of salt and pepper. So in the recipe, you can use a hand mixer. But because I left everything out at room temperature, I should be able to mash this up by hand. Now, this is a great cheese to put together when you have bits and pieces of cheese left from a cheese board. Now, I know we're not gathering as we once did, or else we would all be together right now doing this and you'd be eating the food. Um, but if you're making smaller cheese boards, maybe for a Friday night with drinks for your family, you might still have some leftover cheese. So what I would recommend is don't just pitch it, wrap it up, put it in the fridge and make pimento cheese, okay? So here, and the reason being is because the cream cheese keeps it all together. And then we're gonna add some mayonnaise, okay? And the mayonnaise just gives it a nice little bit of tang and our cheddar cheese, but this is where you can use whatever cheese you want. Um, if you have blue cheese, if you have Gouda, if you have any type of that, that kind of cheese, just add it in here. What the benefit of using the cheddar is, is that it's gonna get a nice golden brown color, which is nice. Not golden brown, golden orange. There, so I'm just doing this by hand and mashing it up together. Now, if you use your mixer, you'll just kind of beat everything up together. You can also just throw this all in your food processor and pulse it up. I just want to get the right amount of Worcester sauce and pimentos. So my measuring spoons are here and we're going to add the Worcester sauce. And if you don't use Worcester sauce, if you happen to be vegetarian, because it is made with fermented anchovies. You can use a little bit of soy sauce or tamari. 
to get that nice saltiness in here, okay? All right, let's, let's measure this out and add that in. Stir that up. I'm gonna add a little bit of salt and pepper to this as well. Now, if you happen to be using a really salty cheese, like a blue cheese, for example, or a very aged cheddar, you don't necessarily need to add that little bit of salt because the cheese itself is so salty. So make sure you taste it first so that you know. There we are. And then here's where we get to add some color with our pimentos. Now, the pimentos are in a brine, so you do want to drain them well so that you don't make your cheese too wet and sloppy. I'm just going to kind of squeeze them out here. Now, these are already diced, so I don't even have to chop them. Sometimes you will have pimentos that are in strips just like you would find uh, roasted red peppers. And if, you, if that was the case, then you definitely would have to chop them up a little bit. So in go my pimentos. Now, if you really wanna go back to the 70s, you can chop up some olives and add those to this too. <laughs> and then shape it into a cheese ball and roll it in some dried parsley. That probably might scare some people, so don't do that. Or you could shape it into porcupines and put some nuts in it. That's when you want you get to have fun with your food. All right, so that is as simple as pimento cheese. So just imagine the possibilities here of how you could use this cheese. We're gonna serve it as an appetizer. So this is perfect to have with drinks. Um, so for those of you that are having a drink, you can whip up a batch of pimento cheese. And whether your drink is water or apple juice or milk or something a little bit stronger, it will all go well. Now, the other thing, so we're gonna serve it up like this with our crackers as an appetizer, but you could also take this. Now, just imagine how much more awesome your grilled cheese would be if you slather, slathered this in the grilled cheese with more cheese. It'd be pretty good. You could also put some on the outside of your grilled cheese and pan fry it for an extra crispy layer. That's kind of gilding the lily, but definitely worth it. So I'm just gonna add my crackers here to my platter. And I like leaving them as a regular shape so that you, know, you have some bigger ones, some smaller ones, because there will be people that will grab a cracker, might not want some of the cheese. But you do have to, in this case, because these crackers are kind of delicate, you do need to have a spoon or a spreader in this cheese to put on the cracker or help yourself on the plate. Because if you try to dip this, the cracker will break, there'll be seeds everywhere, and nobody likes seeds in their, in their cheese spread. Emily, um, Kate was wondering, can you use sundry tomatoes or artichokes like with, oh, I guess, with these crackers or maybe even a substitute of the pimentos in the dip? Um, so to use um, sun-dried tomatoes or artichokes as opposed to the diced um, pimentos? Because that definitely would work. I would add all of them <laughs> because all you're doing is adding more flavor. Now, realizing that not only are the pimentos a little bit salty as well as the cheese, the other ingredients you add may be salty as well. So some dry tomatoes aren't too salty, um, nor are regular canned artichokes, but as soon as you start going into marinated things or olives, as I suggested, they can be a little bit salty. So do make sure every time you add something that um, you taste it. And this is where the recipe is no longer five ingredients. They become your own creative mass of recipes, which is, is kind of nice. However, I always like recommending that you at least try the recipe as written first <laughs> before you make any changes. But I think, I think I, what Kate was saying was a sundry tomato and artichoke dip would be great with the crackers too. I misinterpreted that. Oh, so. okay. Yes, 100%. Or if any hot dip, so if it was a cheese dip, or this would be great with, I'm thinking of those hot crab dips or lobster dips, those types of things. They'd be absolutely delicious or bacon and cheese. The crackers are great, even with soup. 
if you are a soup and cracker fan, they definitely would go really, really nicely with that, 100%. Um, so we have an appetizer, we have some breakfast, dinner's in the oven, let's make dessert. I was trying to give you the full meal deal with five ingredients, just to kind of show you that with all Best of Bridge books. So Best of Bridge, just to give you a little bit of history of what Best of Bridge is. And um, they've been around since the early 70s. It was a group of uh, originally seven women that got together um, to play bridge. I don't play bridge. Um, I don't know anybody who plays bridge anymore, but I know there's still bridge players out there in the world. And it's a card game for those of you that don't know that you get together and you play. Um, so these women were bridge players and they would bring their kids, the kids would play together and they always brought food to the card games. And the word got out that they were making great food. So a lot of their friends were asking for their recipes and they said, hey, why don't we put together a cookbook? And over 4 million copies of books later, <laughs> um, the brand is still going strong. Now, all those original women are not involved with Best of Bridge anymore. Um, there's four still living. And um, I have met one of them and she's lovely. She drinks scotch, so everybody loves her. She starts drinking and she's a blast. Um, and um, so I've been involved with the last three books as well as my co-author, Sylvia Kong, who is in Calgary. So I'm actually the first Ontario-based author of Best of Bridge, um, which is a little bit crazy because I have to explain the whole Alberta connection um, and then bring it to Ontario. Although if you know anybody that's lived in the West, um, most people know what Best of Bridge is and kind of it's been a hand-me-down cookbook um, for many, many years, which is kind of nice. And we hope to continue that because the recipes are, as you can see, straightforward and easy. In particular, these ones are even easier because they're five ingredients. So we do have some great five ingredient recipes for desserts. I told you about the olive oil cake, which I'm making, I'm going to have that for um, CH Morning Live tomorrow morning. But I thought, let's do tarts. Because everything that I picked tonight has a purpose. And I love appetizers. So I thought the cheese and crackers for sure is a winner. Um, I love make ahead pancakes, great make ahead I love breakfast. And sheet pan dinners, it's chicken, you can't go wrong with chicken. And it's jerk seasoning, a great flavor. I love tarts. There, I said it, I love tarts. I don't always like making pastry. Um, so guess what? You don't have to make pastry. You're going to buy frozen tart shells and bake them. And I already did that. So I'm using the mini tart shells, which are, they come about 18 in a package and you just pop them in a 400 degree oven. They take about 10 minutes and you just want them to be nice and golden brown, okay? Set them aside, you're done. So technically the rest is no bake which is another great way to make dessert. You don't have to bake anything. Um, now, if you can't find the mini tart shells, you can just use the regular tart shells. They're 12 in a package. They'll just be a little bit larger, but they will still be just as delicious. These are brown sugar mascarpone tartlets. So maybe not ingredients you have on hand. Mascarpone might be one of them. Oh, that's the chicken. Let's check the chicken. <clears throat> so we're looking for a nice golden brown on the chicken. And on the sweet potatoes. Oh, it looks great. I'm just going to give another five minutes because the sweet potatoes look like they could use a little bit of color. Emily, your family must eat so well. <laughs> the house must smell amazing and they must, you know, be so excited to be able to eat all this afterwards. You know what, Michelle? They would eat well if they all ate everything I made. It's, it's bound. There's, if, there's, I've met many chefs that say, oh, my kids eat everything. And then I've seen their kids, their kids don't eat everything. Um, <laughs> they can become very picky. Um, sometimes it's a surprise at my house um, of what's going to be for dinner, because it may be what I made for a cooking class, for example, um, or for recipes that I've tested. So sometimes it could be a mixture of what we're having tonight, <laughs> breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, or it could actually just be a real meal, which is really delicious too. So I am putting my, this is light brown sugar, and I'm just putting it through a sieve. The reason being is this just helps give me a finer texture for the brown sugar, and if there's any lumps in there. 
Now, if you find that this is gonna be tedious for you and you don't wanna do it, I'm not gonna be in your kitchen, so I won't know that you're not doing it. Um, but I like doing this just to lighten the brown sugar a little bit. If you happen to only have dark brown sugar at home, your tarts will be a little bit darker and a little bit softer, just because dark brown sugar has a little bit more molasses in it, okay? So I like using light brown sugar. And again, un, kind of an unwritten North American rule. Um, when it calls for brown sugar, it's that light golden brown sugar that is in the recipe, unless it states dark brown sugar, okay? There. So I think I got it all just a little bit more. And I have, much like all my ingredients tonight, they've all been at room temperature. Everything comes together much easier when it's at room temperature, okay? I'll just scrape off the bottom there. And I'm going to this, add my mascarpone cheese. So if you've never used mascarpone cheese, I always refer to it as an Italian cream cheese because it doesn't really have a flavor on its own but it has three times the fat as cream cheese, which is what makes it a little bit more exquisite and creamy and delicious. Um, you don't have to buy an Italian mascarpone. And when I say Italian, I mean an import. Um, a lot of the imports are quite expensive, but we make some great Canadian mascarpone cheese. And the milk fat percentage is anywhere from 35 to 45%. So it's very much the same as whipping cream, okay? So when you think of that luscious richness of whipping cream, that's exactly what mascarpone is. So if you've ever had tiramisu, a traditional tiramisu does have mascarpone cheese in it. So you may have eaten it and you didn't even realize, but you can also use it in savory. So we're only using a cup and a third in this, in, um, in this recipe. So you will have some left in the tub. I'm adding a little bit of vanilla here too. You could also add some liqueur if you wanted to. So some um, Cointreau or Grand Marnier if you wanted an orange twist to it, or if you wanted something a little nutty, amaretto would be really nice in here too. So for savory, um, because you're gonna have a little bit of mascarpone cheese left over, you can just add it anywhere you would add cream cheese. So if you're making cheesecake, you could use it there. You could also just add a dollop to a little bit of cream and make a lovely pasta sauce really, really quickly, okay? So there are our three ingredients. I told you our fourth, the baked tart shells, and we need a berry. So there's our fifth ingredient. So I'm going to pipe out this mixture because it's nice and soft. You can just take a spoon and spoon it out, but I'm going to put it in my piping bag. So oftentimes people have difficulty kind of doing this procedure. So make sure you have a cuff on your piping bag so it sits in your hand. And if it's still causing you trouble, you can always just rest this in a glass, a drinking glass, and then fill it just so that you have two hands as opposed to one. So I'm going to scrape it all in here. And then I'm going to set this aside. I'm going to roll up my cuff and then just give it a twist and then just push it down till I see it peeking out. And then I'm gonna get my tart shells. And I heard my timer for the chicken. I'm gonna bring these over here. I'm gonna move some of this stuff so that I can bring the chicken out to show you what it looks like because it smells really good. This is. I know someday this will happen. Someone will figure out how to make the smell come through the computer. I'm going to do this and show you that way. Yes, definitely waft. Waft it into your computer. It smells like jerk seasoning, chicken, and that little hint of sweet potatoes and onions. I'm going to put it here, right in the middle, so that the smell does get to you. There we go. All right. I have to stand in front of it, that's even worse. All right, so I'm going to, um, if you've ever piped anything, sometimes you wanna squeeze it with both hands, just use one as a guide and take the other one and squeeze from the top down and then just kind of give it a little push. I'm using a star tip, you don't have to. It just gives it a nice little 
bit of texture and then just give it a little squeeze. If you wanted to, if you wanted to add something to this other than your five ingredients, you could sprinkle a little bit of chocolate at the bottom as a surprise. You could drizzle these with chocolate if you didn't want the fresh fruit. Okay. The part I always have a problem with when I do these is how much filling do I put in? So it's always best to try to fill them a little bit and then go back and see if you need more. These mini tart shells do have a small base. So you can't really get too much filling in there. I filled the first one so beautifully that I got went a little overboard. There we go. I got a little bit in all of them. And then I'm just going to get my raspberries. I gave them a rinse. And then what I like to do is just put a little bit of paper towel in a bowl and dump them out in there after they've been rinsed just to absorb a little bit of the water. Raspberries have that lovely big gaping hole in them. So they tend to absorb, keep some of the water there. And then you just take your little, these are actually quite large, these raspberries. I, I was thinking I could put two on there, but I think one will do the job. But you can use any of your favorite berries. I love raspberries. They have that nice little bit of tartness to them. But half a strawberry would be lovely or a mixture of blueberries and raspberries on here would be nice. Blackberries are so delicious and sweet. So you could do any of that combination. And if you wanted to, if you didn't have fresh berries, you can use frozen, um, but I would actually put them on frozen when you're serving them, just so that they don't start leaching out the color of the frozen fruit. Okay. Some of these have room for two. So just imagine these on a nice little pedestal cake plate. It'd be quite pretty to serve up. And if you wanted to, because I know we have kind of smaller gatherings right now, you might not need 18 tarts. Um, what you can do is actually fill them as you need them. The filling itself, you can keep in the refrigerator. Um, and then you'll just have to bring it to room temperature to spoon it out because it will kind of thicken up a little bit as it sits in the refrigerator. So you can simply just, you know, make four, eat them, and then make another four and eat those four. I'm, I'm assuming that it's just going to be you eating them, not having, you know, guests over because why not enjoy the, the fruits of your labor, if you will. Chris said he'll <laughs> eat all 18 tarts. <laughs> <laughs> You might be pretty full if you eat all of them. There's no question. <laughs> We're done. We did five. Emily, that's impressive. Can we have a quick recap? Because that was so much. I just want like a quick, quick recap. I, and like not only that, but you're literally 759. I, I don't know. I would love to know how many people feel like they could pull, pull all of that off within an hour. That is amazing. Well, it, technically it's your fault, Michelle. You talked too long in the beginning. So I'm blaming it on you. You're right. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> so let's go back to breakfast. Our blender oatmeal banana pancakes. I was going to say muffins because those are good too. Um, we use oats, bananas, vanilla almond milk, baking powder, and what was the other ingredient? Why can't I remember? The bananas. Did I say bananas? Anyway, blender banana oatmeal pancakes. Our sheet pan dinner, our jerk uh, chicken and sweet potato sheet pan dinner, our chicken, sweet potatoes, onions, thyme, and jerk seasoning. Fabulous quick dinner. Just serve up some green beans and you're good to go. Appetizer, double appetizer, if you will, our homemade seed crackers which had the pumpkin seeds, the flax, sesame seed, and chia seeds with our Italian seasoning in there and baked. And then our pimento cheese, which had cream cheese, cheddar cheese, pimentos, Worcester sauce, and a little bit of mayonnaise. Perfect to go with our seed crackers. And dessert, brown sugar berry tarts. Our tart shells, mascarpone, vanilla, brown sugar, and our fresh berries. All five ingredients, guys. There's so much more in this cookbook too that will take you no time at all. 
Speaking of which, um, so a few more questions. Most people are just saying how hungry are and delicious everything looks. Um, and so one person was asking if you can make the chicken ahead of time, like how do you keep it uh, moist? Hold on a second. Um, about an hour, how do you keep the moisture when serving? Oh, that's, that's with chicken, it can be a little bit tricky. If you are using dark meat, you have the advantage right there. Dark meat typically will retain its moisture. And we're not cooking this to the point of no return. We really are cooking it for, um, in total, almost 40 minutes um, to keep that tenderness. And what you'll notice in um, particularly the drumsticks, you'll start to see the meat kind of pulling away from the bone. The other thing that you can do to ensure that um, your chicken is not overcooked is use an instant read thermometer and you're looking for 165. So you just simply go in and don't hit the bone because the bone will give you a misguided reading. And if you're 165, your juices are running clear, your chicken is cooked. And I would actually, if I'm going to reheat this, um, I know the microwave is what people typically kind of hop on and, and use. But I would actually put this in the oven again in a little casserole dish with a little bit of water or chicken broth and heat it up so that it steams and retains the moisture of the chicken and actually adds some more. And you benefit because you create a little bit of a sauce from the remainder of that jerk seasoning that's on the chicken. So um, it would Sounds work good. really, really well. Um, Tammy was wondering, can you bake the cheese so it's warm when it's served? Oh. Yes, totally. You can totally bake the cheese and it'd be absolutely delicious. Um, and what I would do, again, adding another ingredient, but put it in a casserole dish and bake it. But before you put it in the oven, sprinkle it with a little bit of Parmesan cheese so that it creates an extra crust on top so that when you break into it, it has that nice golden brown color and an additional cheese, which you probably have hanging, it's hanging out in your fridge anyway. So why not use it? <laughs> <laughs> So two quick things, uh, we have to do a draw. Yes, we have to do a draw. So Emily's gonna be giving away one of her cookbooks and um, I will reach out to the winner afterwards and we can coordinate how to get it to you. Um, so let me just do a quick little, I've got all of your names here in a bowl. And I'll the winner- I'll give you a drum roll. Wait, I'll give you a drum okay. roll, Michelle. Not a very good one, but it works. And the winner is, make sure I'm not on mute this time, Tammy Thompson. Congratulations, Yay! Tammy. Congratulations, Tammy. That's great. Um, and I have a, I, oh, I got, we got some. <laughs> nice, <here. laughs> I love it. <laughs> so I have a small request because it's a, a tradition of mine. Um, I'm going to put it on uh gallery view and then if you can for two seconds just put your cameras up and give me a wave so i can take a quick photo uh thank you everyone for participating i really hope you enjoyed it emily you never disappoint i absolutely adore you you are so awesome thank you so much for a great evening <laughs> everyone give me a quick wave everybody wave <laughs> this is always the fun part <laughs> awesome <laughs> Um, so I will follow up with um, recipes to everyone. And, uh, you know, if anyone has any questions or whatnot, Emily is easy to find. And uh, you know where to find her cookbooks. Emily, so Amazon. Yes, Amazon. And um, I just got word this week that they'll be hitting Costco as well. So hopefully in the coming weeks, perfect timing for Christmas. Um, um, you'll find them in Costco as well. So that's always good. And um, for those of you that are near Hamilton or have CH, I'll be on tomorrow morning about 8.20, making more recipes um, from the cookbook as well. Amazing. Um, thank you so much, Emily. Thank you again. That was awesome. I'm super impressed that you pulled that all off within an hour. <laughs> uh, I'm going to try and do the same. I don't know if I will be able to accomplish it, but you never disappoint. And uh, thank you so much for doing this tonight. And thanks for everyone who came out and participated. It's really great having thanks. you. Thanks, Michelle, for <laughs> getting it all organized. And thanks, everybody, for joining me. If you do end up having any questions about what we made tonight or anything about cooking, you'll find me on Facebook at Emily Richards Cooks, on Instagram and Twitter at ER is Cooking. So happy to always help out the best I can. <laughs> awesome. I love it. Well, I know everyone else is hungry too. So 
enjoy everything that you made tonight and uh emily will see you soon thanks everybody have a great night bye